peaceful and violent protests continue in the United States and around the world. What is driving the Black Lives Matter movement? Civil rights leader Niger Innes shares his thoughts. Priest of the Archdiocese of Washington, Monsignor Charles Pope, reveals what he's seeing in his ministry to the black Catholic community in D.C. And later, what happens when the protests subside? What must be done next to heal racial divisions in the country? Attorney and pastor Mark Little is here with insight. And the papal posse, Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray, join me with in-depth analysis of the Vatican's take on the death of George Floyd and much more. Finally, she's the mother of poet and peace advocate Maddie Stepanek. Dr. Jenny Stepanek returns to tell us about the 16th anniversary memorial mass for Maddie and the latest on her son's cause. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. Greetings and a warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. So glad you're with us. Niger Innes, Monsignor Charles Pope, Pastor Mark Little, Father Gerald Murray, Robert Royal, and Jenny Stepanek are all here. Woo. Don't miss any of this. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. But first, as protests against police brutality continued this week, controversial historical monuments were brutally torn down in numerous American cities. A statue of Confederate President Jefferson Davis was toppled in Richmond, Virginia, and several statues of Christopher Columbus were brought down, including one that was beheaded in Boston, Massachusetts, early Wednesday. Four statues at a Confederate memorial in Portsmouth, Virginia, were decapitated by protesters as well. And this cultural cleansing shows no signs of abating. Joining me now to discuss the ongoing protests and the violence in cities all over the country and what's driving the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm joined by the national spokesman of the Congress of Racial Equality, Niger Innes. Niger, thanks for being with us. The nexus of these protests and, and the focus, it seems to me, is Black Lives Matter. That moniker is all over social media. I even see students linking to their website. What is this organization and what are its goals? Let's start there. Well, Raymond, first of all, it is a pleasure to be on with you. I've been a big fan of yours uh, for many, many years, uh, seeing you, uh, you, talking to you privately and publicly on Laura Ingram's program, and it's a real pleasure to be on with you. One little correction, um, I actually got a promotion uh, to uh, become national chairman of the Congress of Racial Equality, which is my okay. title. I don't think I've changed it all in Wikipedia and all my social links. Well, so, there you so, go. So no worries there. You announced it here. I just wanted to let you know about What's that? You, you've announced uh, uh, it here. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah, and I've, I've not, that's right. I've made uh, breaking news uh, on your program. Um, yeah, listen, let me, it's very important, and this is a very, very serious uh, issue. What's going on in our country is extraordinarily serious. Um, the protesters in the street, I want to disconnect, if we will, the protesters mm -hmm. in the street, the overwhelming majority of them are decent Americans trying to do the black and white, in fact, more whites than blacks and Hispanics mm -hmm. and Asians that are just trying to do the right thing. We all saw what happened to George Floyd and we were all abhorred. I think in the beginning there was like um, a poll taken within a few days of the video going viral and 96 percent mm -hmm. of Americans said what right. happened there was immoral, was wrong, and the cops should be prosecuted. Now, I, I distinguish those kids and others out there protesting. I distinguish Pat Mahomes, who is doing some extraordinary things, uh, Michael Jordan, who's doing some extraordinary things. Their heart mm -hmm. and their soul is in the right place. Mm -hmm. I detach that from the founders of the Black Lives Movement. One of the founders of the Black Lives Movement, who was just recently on Meet the Press, uh, Alisa Gar uh, Garza, okay, mm -hmm. is 
and she doesn't hide this, Raymond. I'm not saying this about her. This is what she says about herself. This is what's on her own Wikipedia page. She says that she is a Marxist. If you look at her affiliations, they are all left-wing and Marxist. One of the other uh, people that founded the organization has a picture that she proudly spreads throughout Facebook with Maduro in Venezuela. Okay, so the fact mm. that these founders, the three, and, and by the way, I was just yesterday, this is a total coincidence, just yesterday I'm listening to NPR, because I like to hear all sides, all points of view to get my news, mm. and I was listening to NPR, and they had a representative of Black Lives Matter, and they asked this young man, what is the difference between this extraordinary new civil rights movement, or what are the parallels with this extraordinary mm -hmm. civil rights movement and the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s? And this young man mm -hmm. said, listen, when you had the movement in the 1950s and 60s, they were male-dominated. Essentially, it was one leader, be it Malcolm X or be it Martin Luther King. It was a one person in leadership that the movement rallied uh, around. This is different, and it's different fundamentally for two reasons. One, it's decentralized. The, you know, there are a variety of different leaders. And two, a big difference is the fact that this was founded by uh, feminist, uh, they said feminist queer women. Three feminist mm -hmm. queer women. I didn't say that. He said that, and he said it proudly. And Raymond, if you just go to their own website, because everybody keeps saying, what do they want? What do they want? And we keep talking about defund right. the police. That's just the beginning. Right. That's just the tip of the iceberg, Raymond. If you go to their website, blacklivesmatter.com, you look and it says one of the uh, planks among many, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family. I want to read it verbatim so that I don't get uh, accused of misquoting. Yeah. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages, et cetera, et cetera. And then another plank, we foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking or rather the belief mm. that all in the world are heterosexual unless he or she describes other word, uh, uh, dis dis discloses otherwise. Now, <laughs> listen, you and I and many of your uh, viewers disagree with that agenda, okay? And we can argue, you know, that it's right, that it's wrong, and that's the beauty of our great country, is that we have the First Amendment right to organize, to petition our government, to have a point yeah. of view, and to express that point of view. But well, Niger, my, the, my, so I don't have my a, question is, yeah. how does, yeah. what does that, how does that advance the cause of racial <laughs> equality, and what tangible right. impact do those agenda items have in the black community that you know so well? That, that's exactly the point, Raymond. Those agenda items, a Marxist mentality in this freest country in the world that immigrants try to die to get to, does nothing for the black community. It does nothing to advance racial equality. Having the a disruption of the nuclear family is a clear and present danger to the black community. If you want to look at the crisis within the black community, the fact that black on black crime is a pandemic in the black community and has been for decades. You can directly trace that it back to the fact that fathers have been a ch have been chased away from homes through uh, due to government policy and sometimes our culture and sometimes quite frankly due to irresponsibility. We all know there are it has, calls. it's not just the black family. Pardon? Yeah. No, it's all, you're right, it's the, all the fa blacks, Hispanics, it, whites, it's, it's across it's exactly. the board in American culture. It, it's a crisis for all of us. And the fact that they no. want to disrupt the nuclear family, that is not only something that's going to not forward racial equality, it's going to hold black people back. 
Now, there are calls to defund the police. You mentioned it a moment ago, to get rid of the police force in localities. Uh, I saw a tweet last night that said, uh, BLM is defunding the police. Defund the police is Black Lives Matter. And that was from their official website. Now, look, there's no disputing. George Floyd's death was a disgrace. It was an outrage morally and otherwise. And I've seen other cases of black and white people dying at the hands of police. What policies should Americans be urging now vis-a-vis -vis police and those they encounter? I think the people in the community do not want less police. They want less bad police. Every profession mm. has bad apples. Lawyers, doctors, football players, media commentators, civil rights leaders. Hey, be, we be all careful have bad there. Apples. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean media commentators. They're all good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but, but, but they all, all professions have bad apples. The community wants less bad police. They want more. You know, I was just talking with somebody and they said, why don't they do what folk used to do in the old days in fraternities? You have a fraternity and you have a couple of bad actors in that fraternity and you go out, you take them behind the, 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 the barn and you kick their butt. Not because you want to hurt them, but because you want to help them. You want to save them. And that's what the people in the community want. But they actually want more an increased commun uh, police community uh, presence. They want more engagement by the police. They, may, they want more intervention by the police, and they want more of a partnership between the police and decent people mm -hmm. in the community. You know this, Raymond. The number of black, unarmed blacks that have died at the hand of police in the entirety of 2019 is less than 15. I've heard estimates 15. I've heard it as low as 8. But let's say less than 15. Mm -hmm. The number mm -hmm. of blacks killed by other blacks nationwide is 5,000, was 5,000. It's actually mm -hmm. more, much more than 5,000 in, in 2019. In Chicago alone, the number of blacks that have died is 60 in, over the last wow. several weeks. You know, come on. This, this is, no. you know, you, we're talking about a, a, a little speck when the entire body of black America is dying. Hmm. Uh, I want you to react to something. I only have two minutes, Niger. In a recent USA Today article entitled, A Letter to My Former White Friend, a black woman writes to her white friend, um, I want to read you a couple of excerpts here. She says, I've noticed the distinct absence of any comments on the prolific murders of black people in America. My ancestors, ancestors picked cotton until blood ran red from their fingers. Their lives did not matter in America. They were three-fifths a man. They were commodities. They were disposable. So do you think I'm disposable, too? Is that why you will not say Black Lives Matter? I'm fine with us not being friends anymore, truly. Being friends with someone who denies blackness is exhausting. This letter is not an invitation for friendship. This letter is a request. This letter is a plea. This letter is a tombstone. Now, your reaction to that, um, uh, Niger, obviously laced with pain, but there's that line, we've heard it over again, why won't you say Black Lives Matter? Say that line. Why is that important? Look, what I say is, of course, it's, it's, it's absurd to even the, the, the whole concept of uh, the, the question itself. Of course, black lives matter. But I think white lives matter, too. I think Asian lives matter. I think Hispanic lives matter. By the way, I think blue lives matter. OK, I think, uh, by the way, I think all black lives matter, not just those killed by white police. In other words, from the womb to the tomb, I believe black lives matter. And for those who believe in life, as I do, we know who founded Planned Parenthood. We know that it was Margaret Sanger, who was a eugenicist, that wanted to wipe out undesirables. And it wasn't just blacks she was talking about. She was talking about mm. Italian-Americans, uh, immigrants who were coming into the country at that time in the early part of the 20th century. She was talking about Eastern yep. Europeans, Jews and, and Catholics. She was talking about whatever you label the undesirables of the day.
And that is the entity that is promoting abortion in communities of color to this very day. And you can be sure that the Marxists who run the BLM movement will never utter a word about that reality, the fact that that organization was founded to destroy black lives. Mm. Niger Innes, a powerful way to end. We will leave it there. Hope you'll come back. You can follow Niger Innes's work at the Congress of Racial Equality at thecongressofracialequality.org. Thanks again, Niger. Thank you, Raymond. Joining me now with his perspective is a man who's ministered to the black Catholic community in Washington, D.C., as a priest of the Archdiocese of Washington for years. He's a columnist for the National Catholic Register. Welcome to the program, Monsignor Charles Pope. Monsignor, you've served most of your life in predominantly African-American parishes. You've seen ra racism up close. In light of the ongoing protests and the rioting, what are your parishioners telling you, and what are they looking for from the church? Yeah, you know, and I, I've ministered in the black community. I'm also, as you know, I'm kind of in the wide church, too. And I hear from a lot of different sides in the church. And starting with the African-American community, I mean, I, I think that what we have to re recognize is that there's, there's been a long and a shared grief in the African-American community. Uh, you know, whatever the statistics show, there's a very strong perception and experience among them of, um, of, of pr police brutality, distrust, uh, kind of a disparity mm -hmm. in the way they are treated. Um, and, uh, not, you know, not just by the police, but in other settings and trying to hail a cab while black, you know, these, these types of experiences are very real. These are good, solid men and women. Uh, they're not, you know, just some, you know, someone who's making up a story. These are people I've, I've almost grown up with and, and, uh, I, I believe them and their experiences are very real and they have grief and I hold that grief in my heart as, as a priest. And so... That's certainly in my, in my experience in the African-American community, that racial injustices are still very real. Mm -hmm. And what are they asking for the church? What do they want the church to do in this moment? Well, I, I think generally there's a lot of d differences, yeah, but I would say the general ask is that I think all of us become more aware of it. And I think one of the things, Raymond, we do very poorly in our culture, all of us, is to really learn to listen to each other's experiences and not just discount it, but to, to incorporate it and to include it and to work very hard to... Um, whenever we see it, to overcome it, and when to look into our own hearts and and to to see where some of that might lurk itself, you know, that um, how, how we perceive other people and treat them. So that would be, I think, the primary ask. Now, there there could be lots of legal things that, you know, that's going to vary with person to person. Right. All right. Now, this past Saturday, you led a rosary procession in Washington D.C. with lay and religious Catholic faithful praying for the healing of racism for the community. Why aren't we seeing more uh, peaceful, prayerful demonstrations like this coming from the Catholic Church, not only in Washington, across the country? Yeah, well, I, I think that, uh, I, I hope that we, we actually are, and maybe some are just more hidden. In fact, we didn't go down to Lafayette Square intentionally because we wanted this mm -hmm. to not be politicized. Too much of this has become mm -hmm. about the president. This is about George Floyd. It's about people, who, you know, he represents in terms of the, the experience of, with the police. This is about looking to our own hearts. So we just earnestly right. wanted to pray that we walked in our own Capitol Hill neighborhood. Maybe that doesn't get as much coverage. And, of course, our mm -hmm. churches, so many of them are shut down. It's harder for us to be seen out there together. Uh, all of these are factors. And, you know, uh, there's yeah. um, a lot of frust frustration that we've been excluded. You know, our churches are still closed while other people are out demonstrating. There's all sorts of things that run through people's minds. Yeah, yeah. No, here in New Orleans, our archbishop led a procession, which also got very little coverage, but it was a quiet procession, and it was black and white Catholics moving along. And like D.C., you know, this is a very vibrant, we have a very vibrant black Catholic community here. Um, but again, he, he, didn't, he didn't make a big show of it. He didn't go downtown. Uh, it, and as you said, we have to depoliticize this thing. I mean, it's becoming, because we're in a presidential year, it's becoming about presidential politics, even though this is a local matter in Minneapolis. Though it happens across the country, these are local police departments. The president, the Congress doesn't have control over these police departments and, and, and the brutality or lack thereof in the, on the local level. It's a case by case. Last Friday, you wrote a piece in the National Catholic Register, a priestly testimony of grief in these times. 
And you point out that Catholics all share the outrage of what happened to George Floyd, but they're also grieving at being kept away from the sacraments. And even over the language uh, Archbishop Gregory used when the president visited the John Paul II shrine last week, you're right, Archbishop Gregory said, I find it baffling and reprehensible that any Catholic facility would, be, would allow itself to be so egregiously misused and manipulated in a fashion that violates our religious principles. Agree or not, these are strong, vigorous words, you write. But why are such strong, vigorous words not heard in denunciation of other Catholic institutions that have chosen to honor Speaker Nancy Pelosi or Father James Martin or others who violate our religious principles? What effect does this selective outrage have on Catholics, do you think? It's, a, it's an experience of disparity. And that's why, as I say, as I think in my heart as a priest, I have so many African-American people I know and love and have ministered to over the years and continue. Mm -hmm. There's so many other people I know and love through the wider church, through my writings and EWTN radio and, uh, and programs like this. And they all write to me and they're really saying the same thing. They experience a lot of disparity, that, that, that there's, there's selective outrage, that, um, that some of our key core principles go ignored. And this isn't just Archbishop Gregory, who I think probably spoke very forthrightly, um, but would that this appeals to all the bishops, would that they would be so forthright about, as, as, as you mentioned, just some examples like that. So that, that causes real grief, real grief in people's hearts that is, 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 a, is, a, is a, for a different reason, but it's that same yeah. grief. We're not being treated fairly. Uh, we who sit in the pews and really care about issues of transgenderism or marriage or you know, you know, uh, abo you know abortion and and uh, and so on, and we're not really being get, given a, an even-handed treatment with some others who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who, who there was outrage experienced very quickly by the bishop. So again, these mm -hmm. would be that's that's a grief about disparity. And so, isn't it interesting? Two very different groups, but they have really really have the same complaint, and this ultimately unites us that. Um, there's sometimes an unfairness or a disparity in treatment that, that, that people experience. Mm -hmm. In a recent blog post you talked about, we only have a couple of minutes, uh, you talked about secularism, materialism, individualism being significant challenges to the churches preaching the gospel today. After that rosary procession this weekend, uh, you indicated that the problems we're seeing in regards to racism and police brutality are uh, not black or white problems, uh, but but a much graver problem. And there's no doubt there's been a breakdown of community in the last few decades, beginning with the breakdown of the family. Talk to us about how the breakdown of the family and the lack of integrated friendships and living have brought us to this moment. This is something I always think about, Monsignor, because unlike living in Northern Virginia, where you rarely encountered other people of other races, I mean, what I, what I mean by that is black people and white people didn't frequent the same places. I live in a city where w we do everything together here, you know, including have families together. So it's a very different culture. <clears throat> Yes, it is. And, you know, as you mentioned, the breakdown of the family. Look, the breakup of the family is the nuclear fission of civilization. The family, the individual is not the basic unit of society, the, the, the family is. And, you know, the, the, you split the family, it's like you split the atom, and tremendous destructive potential goes out in all directions that if it's not reined in, it will lay everything waste. And so it starts there. But also, we're, we're, we used to have a shared experience of a kind of a, a biblical world vision, that began to break down in the 50s, and it's, it's all but gone now. And so you have people like uh, Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio saying faith had nothing to do with turning back the COVID virus, and there's no place for this. And our, the opening of churches is tough. It's okay to go out and protest, uh, but don't you dare open those churches. That is far too dangerous for you to gather in those churches. Uh, and again, that's a perceived disparity that causes believers everywhere real grief. That that it, protest has its place, but prayer. Prayer is, has right. its place, and we're no longer First just, Amendment. There's no respect for this or secularism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Monsignor, thank you for your insights, and uh, you can read more of Monsignor Charles Pope's blogs by visiting the National Catholic Register's website, ncregister.com. Monsignor, thank you for being here. Good, thank you. He is an attorney and pastor of No Longer Bound Abortion Recovery Ministry in Los Angeles. He's working to promote anti-poverty initiatives on Capitol Hill 
and in urban communities across the country. To tell us what must be addressed in the black community once these protests calm down is Pastor Mark Little. He joins us via Skype. Pastor, thank you for being with us. Um, uh, uh, you've written that once the protests and riots have died down in the wake of George Floyd's death, we will be left with the need to face race relations in America and there'll be a need for black pastors across all denominations to play an active role. What might that role look like concretely? Thank you so much, Raymond, for having me, and thank you for your show. Uh, and thank you for that question. Uh, we are at a very, very interesting time uh, in our nation, both spiritually and practically. Uh, and so your question really has two parts. Uh, the role that we must first play is to be truth tellers. Uh, it is so important for the nation to understand uh, that what we're looking at and experiencing right now is not about race. And so our response needs to understand that. In this season, it is, it is a spiritual matter. Uh, we've got an organization that's leading us into anarchy. We have an organization that says they care about black lives, but refuse to celebrate uh, and honor David Dorn or the 20 million babies aborted. So it's not about race. It's about power. And so with respect to your question, what role must pastors play? We have to understand uh, that it's about identity in Christ first and foremost, number one. If we understand our purpose and our calling, uh, then we're able to move throughout the culture to do what we need to do. Uh, the Bible tells us in Luke 10, 27, that we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's important. That, that, has, that has everything to do with how we intersect and interact with one another in the culture. There's a place for confession. There's a place for repentance. But we have to start with understanding our identity. We are all born with the imago Dei, the image of God. And so, Raymond, when I see people laying prostrate, pr prostrate uh, as white folks, apologizing uh, for the sins of the nation, that looks like idolatry to me. That is mm -hmm. ungodly. So I'm very concerned about how we respond to this when this is all said and done. We have to understand yeah. that it's not about race, brother. Yeah. Pastor, I, you know, I, I observed the same thing you did. There is a there's an odd, almost pagan um, uh, form that these protests are taking where they have hijacked religious expression, whether it be confession, genuflection, uh, uh, hand motions, uh, group recitation of credos. It is odd to see that that and, and how quickly people get get uh, swept up in the in the practice of it, uh, certainly more than than religion in many cases. Now, you talk about trauma in the black community from feeling less than uh, trauma from witnessing domestic violence, drug abuse, crime, abortion. And you write, quote, we must do the healing work within the black community and we must do it now. We don't need whites to help clean our dirty laundry. The black community needs a season of introspection and healing. Undiagnosed trauma needs to be diagnosed so that our healing takes place first and then reconciliation with other cultures may begin. Talk to me for a moment about that vision for healing and the role of father figures in the African-American community. Thank you so much, Raymond. In, in our ministry, No Longer Bound, abortion and miscarriage recovery ministry, uh, we have men and women uh, across all ethnicities uh, who come in through the portal of the pain, guilt, and shame of having had an abortion. And invariably, without exception, uh, we end up finding uh, that they have father wounds, fathers that were either not in the home uh, or fathers or uncles who molested them, uh, witnessing domestic violence, etc. I can go down the list. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it's very clear to me that we have a community uh, walking around with undiagnosed trauma. In the church that I helped run in Southern California, uh, they, we have a, a, a counseling center and we have what's called a, a, the Ulmer Institute that deals with trauma. We did a survey in our church about trauma. Everyone invariably said they didn't have it. But then when we began to ask, well, have you witnessed a drive-by shooting? Have you witnessed your mother or your aunt or your daughter or your, uh, your sister mm -hmm. be beaten in domestic violence? They, yes, they say, yes, yes, yes. Undiagnosed trauma. And so what we've seen recently in this 
response, by the way, I want to make it clear that I support peaceful protest, but what we've seen in this response, it's akin to stepping on my toe and my response is to stab you. Uh, that to hmm. me uh, connects with what we see in our ministry. You have rage in people, they don't understand why, but when you step on their toe, they want to go then burn down a building, there is undiagnosed trauma. And that's a role uh, in large part for the church to play, for the uh, leaders to play, uh, to call mm -hmm. out uh, there's no stigma in getting counseling. We have to begin our own healing uh, before we try to punish uh, someone else for our pain. Hmm. Well, what do you say to those, and I've heard it this week, that, that say whites are to blame for the pain and the trauma in the black community with discrimination, racial profiling, police brutality, and therefore it's whites that need to make up Rep, rep, make reparations for the problems in black America and your thoughts on Black Lives Matter and its uh, policy prescriptions. And so unfortunately, the issues are being conflated now because we're being mm -hmm. driven by a Marxist organization founded uh, by three uh, lesbians. I don't have a problem with LGBTQ. Uh, that's between them and God. Uh, but their platform is very clear uh, that it is about defunding the police. It's about destabilizing our economy, and it's about capitalism versus socialism. So that's what we're following. We have to be very clear about uh, what, what's going on in our community today. Uh, in addition to that, Raymond, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have to understand uh, that race and racism does exist. I love what our sister mm -hmm. Alveda King said, they're one human race. We just happen to be different right. ethnicities. Uh, and it's okay to understand uh, that some folks have experienced uh, trauma. They've experienced racism. I have them in my own circle. I have a friend who's afraid uh, to go to Compton to see his mother because he's going to be racially profiled. Those things exist. Mm -hmm. The response to that is to elect proper leaders over us, uh, to hold police accountable uh, with citizen uh, oversight uh, uh, commissions, which, by the way, is hard to do because most of these folks are appointed by the leaders. Uh, and so we've got to dig deep into that. But there are ways mm -hmm. to respond uh, to the things that are happening with uh, police uh, uh, departments and, and even in employment. Uh, we've got uh, legislation and laws in place that were enacted in 1964 and 1965 with respect to civil rights. Those things are happening. Right. But here's the point, Raymond, here's the point. We can have government put laws in place, but sin, evidences itself in the heart, in racism. It's a heart problem. And so that's where prayer, uh, that's where uh, doing the love your neighbor as yourself comes in as believers. Uh, we cannot forsake the, the reality that it, this is a sin issue as it relates to racism. And I can tell mm -hmm. you this, uh, if we lift up a standard, God will do the work. Uh, as believers, mm -hmm. we have to be the models. We have to be salt and light. Our identity in Christ is that we're salt and light. The question is, are we salty? Are we shining? That's the question. Mm -hmm. If believe Before I let you go, P Pastor Little, is that sin, you talked about the sin of racism, and it really does reside in the heart, and I would agree. Is that a corporate sin, or is that personal? Very quickly. Thank you so much. It is personal. It is personal, and that's why the one-to-one, -one, loving your neighbor as yourself, is so important. It's not corporate. Mm -hmm. This nation is not a racist nation. There are people in it who, in their hearts, have sinned. Mm -hmm. We all have sinned and fallen short of yeah. the glory of God. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. Pastor Mark Little, we'll check in with you again, and you can visit theprodigalrepublican.com for more on Pastor Mark Little and his work. Thank you again. Thank you. Father Gerald Murray and Robert Royal are next. But first, former Vatican nuncio to the U.S. and whistleblower Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano sent an open letter to President Donald Trump warning the president about the threats of globalism and the so-called deep state. In the letter, Vigano ascribes a political motive to the management of COVID-19, calling it a colossal operation of social engineering. He also claims that the children of darkness are using the protests to legitimize violence and crime. President Trump thanked the former nuncio for the letter via a tweet, which read, so honored by Archbishop Vigano's incredible letter to me. 
And in Rome, Pope Francis made a couple of significant appointments this week. Bishop Mitchell Rosansky of Springfield, Massachusetts, has been named the 10th Archbishop of St. Louis. Archbishop-elect Rosansky uh, succeeds Archbishop Robert Carlson, who reached mandatory retirement age last year. Rosansky is said to have a warm pastoral style and is described as a solid moderate. With this appointment, Pope Francis will have named 13 of the 32 metropolitan archbishops in the U.S. Also appointed 49-year-old Monsignor David Toops of St. Petersburg, Florida, was named Bishop of Beaumont, Texas. Toops has been a parish priest as well as a seminary rector. He also worked for a time at the Bishops' Conference. Joining me now with in-depth analysis of all of this and much more is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, and canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to get right to this. Uh, it's now come to light that D.C. Archbishop Wilton Gregory was invited to attend that presidential event at the St. John Paul II Shrine several days before the event took place, and not the night before, as was originally reported in some media. Uh, in correspondence obtained by CNA, the Archbishop's office declined the, quote, kind invitation to attend the event celebrating international religious freedom on Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020 at the John Paul II Shrine, and due to a prior commitment, uh, he couldn't attend. Now, Archbishop Gregory objected to the presence of the president, which he said was a misuse and manipulation of the shrine. Catholic bishops have dealt with presidents with whom they disagree over decades. Why do you think Archbishop Gregory is so aggressive in his denunciation of this visit? Robert Royal. I think he doesn't like President Trump. It's very, it's very clear. And he has a right to like or not dislike him. But as Archbishop of Washington, D.C., he has an obligation to be the bishop of everybody in this city. And I think that whether he knew a week ahead of time or a day ahead of time, it didn't help things to put out this inflammatory statement when what he could have said was this is an inopportune time, you know, the country is in turmoil, there, there are riots everywhere. Instead, he made it appear, and I think Father Raymond D'Souza wrote a beautiful article about this, he made it personal as well as political. So I, I just mm -hmm. don't think this was the best approach at a time when we needed someone not to just politicize, but to use that Christian standpoint to bring peace and, and healing and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. No, it could have been a real bridge-building moment. Uh, Father Jerry, you want to add anything? Well, Raymond, uh, the archbishop had regretted that he couldn't be at the event a few days before he issued that press statement. And, uh, you know, he, he said he regretted the uh, inability to attend an event, which he later then basically said was reprehensible. So there's right. different messaging going on here. One thing to the White House, one thing to the rest of the world. Uh, it's better to just respect the presidency, no matter who holds it, and uh, leave it at that. Yeah. On Monday, Catholic priests were invited by Father Daniel Carson. He's the vicar general of the Archdiocese of Washington to join a prayerful protest in front of the White House. Clergy were instructed, uh, instructed to wear their cassocks, habit, or black clerical shirt and to bring a water and mask and, you know, a hat uh, as appropriate signs and posters uh, were suggested as well. Now, several priests said they were surprised by the invitation, especially given that Priests have been told for weeks they cannot meet in groups of the faithful or open churches. So it's okay to meet if you're protesting, but not for mass. Robert Royal, your thoughts? Well, again, I think the archbishop is passionate about race relations, and that's fine that he should try to do what he can to move it forward. But what he's done in other contexts, he's, he's put out other statements. He spoke at Georgetown last week. And he says that what people are trying to tell him is he shouldn't be involved. I don't think that that's true at all. I think that people are, are saying be involved, but also be aware that you, too, have to be politically neutral. And, and instead, what has happened is he's put himself on one side as if Donald Trump represents racism. And he's the reason why we've had this horrible um, situation in this country. Look, when 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 uh, Barack Obama was president, a black man as president, we also had police violence. We also had rioting and looting. 
So it's, it's not the man in the White House that does this, like him or not like him. And of course, Trump does raise passions on, on both sides. But I, I think he's putting himself that, that makes it easy to dismiss him as if he were just on one side of a partisan divide rather than someone who is trying to bring all sides together. Okay. Um, I, I want to share something the Pope read at his Wednesday audience, and this was a message uh, particularly about what we're encountering here in the United States. He said, I've witnessed with great concern the disturbing social unrest in your nation in these past days following the tragic death of Mr. George Floyd. We cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form, and yet claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. Now, a visiting fellow at Yale Divinity School told the AP, quote, France Francis wants to send a clear message, a very clear message, to those conservative Catholics who are pro-Trumpers that, listen, this is just as much of an issue as abortion is, and to pay attention to the racism that is happening and the racism that is in your own church in America. Uh, I'd like to get your reaction, Father Jerry Merritt. Well, that's overstating it. Um, to blame the President of the United States for the horrible killing of George Floyd by a criminal police officer. It's not, that's not Donald Trump's fault. Uh, I think there's a transference going on here that people who don't like Trump are now basically saying uh, Trump is a racist, the Republicans are racist, we have to turn away from that. Uh, let everybody in a free society can make their own judgments. But to claim, as this person is now saying, that Pope Francis is suddenly aligning everybody with the anti-Trump movement, uh, this is too much. And let me just say also that, um, you know, the exploration of the state of the United States regarding racism should be done rationally, calmly, and with facts, and not with this coercive spirit of, unless you agree with Black Lives Matter and their demands to defund the police, then you're a racist. Uh, that's horrible. In fact, that is a kind of a coercive speech and using of uh, cruelty against your opponent by basically saying, if you don't agree with us right from the start, you're a racist and we're not going to talk to you anymore. That's not what the way this country uh, should be uh, managing its affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, on Wednesday, the State Department released the 2019 International Religious Freedom Report. During the news conference, Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback, commented on how COVID could be used by governments. Watch. We're very concerned that in the future, you're going to see a number of governments that see an advantage here, a chance, okay, we shut down all these religious institutions. We're going to keep them shut down after the COVID crisis passes because we don't like these religious institutions operating freely in the first place. Now, Robert Royal, I've heard from some bishops suggesting that the COVID-19 is being used conveniently here in the U.S., to discourage people or stop people from gathering at mass while indulging protesters. Do you expect the U.S. bishops to speak out on this issue and our First Amendment right? Well, I don't expect it, but I, I wish they would, because there's a, a fundamental relationship between the church and the government at stake here. Now, we, we are nervous in this country where we still have a, a large swath of our people who are religious and affirm that in public and try to hold our government accountable. We can imagine what is going to happen in other parts of, of the world where they don't have a sound of a, a religious or a political tradition and have very high handed government authorities who don't even need the excuse for COVID, but will just use this as one step step further. So I think our bishops have to be quite firm about this, quite firm that they believe in the science they believe in keeping people safe, but also in the fact that the churches should not be treated differently than other essential institutions in society. All right. All right. Speaking of religious freedoms, China has one of the worst records and continues to persecute the faithful there. The Vatican-China deal is set to expire in September. And this week, Archbishop Claudio Maria Celi, who was instrumental in negotiating and executing the first Vatican-China deal, said the Holy See should probably reconfirm the deal for one or two years. Jelly went on to say this, quote, it will not be easy. The Holy See still wants to continue on this step. 
We want to move forward and we want to reach a normality in which Chinese Catholics can express all of his fidelity to the gospel and also with respect to his being Chinese. I always say, I use a very simple expression, that the Catholic Church in China must be fully Chinese, but it must also be fully Catholic. Father Jerry, I, I, I have to say I, I was kind of surprised by these comments. The Chinese government is communist and atheistic. They're releasing versions of the Bible leased with communist propaganda as we speak, and the faithful and bishops are rounded up routinely. If this deal is renewed, what do you expect to see? Well, more of the same bad stuff coming from the Chinese communist government. I think that the comments by uh, the archbishop there are most regrettable. First thing I'll point out is, what deal are we talking about? This deal has never been published. Right. We've never seen the documents. Yeah. So therefore, how can we Good comment point. on whether it's been fully implemented or been beneficial according to its own terms? Secondly, if he wants the church to be fully Chinese, well, then why aren't the Chinese bishops themselves in Hong Kong, for instance, consulted and Cardinal Sin, for example, Sin, excuse me, for example, was completely ignored during the course of these negotiations. The facts are on the air. Just go to the videotape. You can see the communist Chinese are persecuting the Catholics. This deal is unworthy. This deal should never have happened, and it should be basically put in the garbage can, and let's start all over again. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, and not only Catholics, the Uyghurs, the Muslims, the, the uh, evangelicals, the home church people, they're all persecuted and rounded up. Uh, it's unless they, they toe the line of the communist regime. So we'll see what form this takes. But as you said, we still haven't seen the text of the last deal, much less the new one. Last Friday, an essay was posted by one of the victims of Theodore McCarrick, who also was involved, by the way, with negotiating that Vatican deal. Uh, these survivors call themselves Nathans. That's the term they use. Uh, he, one of them commented on the Vatican investigation and the forthcoming McCarrick report. He writes this, persons tasked by the Holy See with investigating McCarrick's career, reached out to me directly as well as to several of the other Nathans and asked us if we would be willing to provide facts and information to help ensure the accuracy of the report and contribute to its findings. Whereas the CDF administrative penal process back in December of 2018 that resulted in McCarrick's laicization was narrowly focused on the specific acts of sexual abuse that McCarrick committed, the more recent lines of inquiry covered a much broader scope. Based on what I've seen with my own eyes, the Holy See's investigation looks to me like a genuine search for the truth. Robert Royal, what do you make of this essay? And th though the report was promised earlier in the year, when do you think we're going to see it? Well, we thought, we heard through various sources that it was already written. So right. the fact that they're reaching out now again either, either says they have very little confidence in what was produced by the earlier version of this investigation, mm. or are we just getting a delaying tactic? I, I don't even know what to say. We are at, This month is going to be two years that this right. investigation has been promised. Uh, presumably, people have been coming here to Washington and digging into this material here. We've heard nothing from the Washington Archdiocese. So I don't have a great deal of confidence. I'm glad that this particular person feels that there is a more serious spirit here. But we thought that this had already been done. And I think that yeah. it's, uh, it's a sign that there's no great sense of urgency to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. Father Jerry, last word to you. Penton uh, reported on Twitter last week that multiple requests for information on when the McCarrick report would be released uh, were answered by no, no answer. In other words, they went unanswered. Uh, I think what we're dealing with here is an unfortunate bureaucratic uh, mindset, which is uh, that the longer something goes uh, hidden, uh, the less people are interested in it. And that is most regrettable. We were told by uh, Cardinal O'Malley back in November of 2019 uh, that the report would be coming out soon. Uh, we were also right. told by American bishops who visited with the Pope during their ad limines in November, in October, November, and December, that they talked about the report and that it would be coming out. Uh, the Pope back in August of 2019 talked about, or 2018, excuse me, talked about uh, being honest and open and straightforward. In other words, 
the whole uh, phenomenon of hiding things and keeping them from the people which gave rise to this crisis, that's only going to be remedied if this report is published. So I heartily encourage those in the Vatican, those advising the Pope, to make mm -hmm. this report uh, public, to do well, it soon, because second anniversary of the McCarrick revelations should not be a moment for people saying, well, what actually happened? We need to know what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My guess is the thing governing the timetable for the release more than anything else, there are two factors. One is McCarrick's health, and two is the lifting of the statute of limitations in these states involved and whether they want to release this kind of data that could redound back to their detriment into the public domain. That's my guess. Gentlemen, thank you. Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, you can find both of their commentaries at thecatholicthing.org. She is the mother of Maddie Stepanek, the prolific poet, peace advocate, and philosopher. Countless souls have been touched by his message and the Catholic faith that informed it. Jenny Stepanek carries on her son's message. She's here tonight to tell us about the upcoming 16th anniversary memorial mass for Maddie and give us the latest on his cause for sainthood. Please welcome Dr. Jenny Stepanek. Jenny, I'm so glad you're here. How does Maddie's message resonate in the world today? Though he's been gone for nearly two decades, what do you think he would say, given the division we're seeing all over the country? Uh, I believe that Maddie would be very, very clear. He would begin with, peace is possible. And as a Christian, he would ask, what would Jesus do? Because that's how he lived his life. I think, I believe that Maddie would be weeping for the civil unrest. He would be weeping for the racial injustices that continue and have been a part of our history for hundreds of years. But I believe he also would be very positive and outspoken about we are many parts in one body, that we are a mosaic of gifts, and that we need to continue this conversation and education and a celebration of this mosaic um, and to stop the injustice and to take care of our neighbors of all colors. Mm. Maddie called his messages heart songs. I want to play this. Here he is with Oprah. A heart song doesn't have to be a song in your heart, even talking about love and peace. Some people might even call it a conscience. Mm -hmm. It's your message, what you feel you need to do. Now, Maddie's calling, Jenny, was to share Christ's message of peace. How did that heart song um, begin, and where is it today in your estimation? Um, I think it began when he was born. I think as his words came in and his understanding of life and people in our world and um, spirituality evolved and grew, um, it, he further shaped mm -hmm. the heart song. Um, for Maddie, heart song is the equivalent of our purpose, our reason for being, um, mm -hmm. and it's given to you by God from the moment of conception. And I think in today's world, Maddie would still believe that his heart song would be to be a messenger, to listen to what God placed in his heart and choose mm -hmm. the words to shape that message in a way that people can understand. Uh, the cause for Maddie's sainthood has progressed since the last time we spoke. Uh, tell us where we are today, and in full disclosure, I'm the founder of the Guild, so I want that put out there. And, uh, and I, you know, I always believed Maddie uh, could be and should be the patron saint of those suffering with disability the, and those who have been called for a special purpose, but the young particularly, the very young, and I think today they need that witness. The Guild is growing. It's, it's moved from you having a conversation with one other person about this needs to begin, a cause needs to be open, mm -hmm. um, to um, formal meetings, masses celebrating his anniversary, to actually doing research on what is the process of canonization, what information do we need, and how do we set up a relationship and connect with our local archbishop um, how do we seek testimonials? Um, and the Guild uh, now has, uh, it's a nonprofit. It's got um, organization, there's a president, there's a secretary, um, and they're gathering all that information and testimony and meeting with people 
have, who have worked on other guilds to gather information on um, what do we need to gather and support. So a lot of wonderful things are happening. We have a website that people can always stay up to date on or get on our mailing list for monthly updates. Uh, the MaddieMatters.org website, everything's up there. Mm -hmm. Great. And Matty would have been 30 years old in July. He died 16 years ago. It's hard to believe uh, this June 22nd. The Guild is having a memorial mass on Monday, June 22nd. It will be a virtual mass. Tell us about this year's memorial and how people can participate quickly, Jenny. Um, Father Jude uh, with the Catholic University of America campus ministry, my alma mater, um, he mm -hmm. does a Monday mass every week uh, through a Facebook link. And we will have all that information up on the MaddieMatters.org website. Well, we will be tuning in. I'll encourage everybody to do the same. Jenny, thank you so much for being here. Um, you're certainly in our prayers, as is Maddie. Maddie, pray for us. And for more, you can go to the MaddieMatters.org website. All the information will be there. That 16th anniversary memorial mass to honor Maddie will be celebrated virtually on Monday, June 22nd, 9 a.m. Eastern. And you can go also to the Catholic University of America's campus ministry page. But MaddieMatters.org is probably easier. Thank you so much, Raymond. And School's Out and Summer's Here, all three installments of the Will Wilder series is now available in paperback and audiobook. You can visit willwilderbooks.com for a preview, and you can order yours. Experience the adventure with your whole family. And don't forget, The World Over is available as a podcast. Visit Apple's iTunes podcast store. You can search World Over. On Spotify, we're at EWTN World Over. That's all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. We have some incredible special guests next week and a musical star, but I'm not telling you who. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.